Okay, I'd like you to turn to Exodus chapter 16, if you would. Exodus chapter 16. Okay, so this has nothing to do with the message. But I set down three coins on the table and a little piece of paper. Uh, I've not been a collector of coins. I've collected quarters back when they were doing the states, I think. And I found out, you know what they're worth? They're worth a quarter. <laughs> and they came out with the ones that were, were, they said they were gold, but they were quarters. And you could buy them in packs of 25. $25 worth, I think, and you know what they're worth, or dollars. They're worth a dollar. They're not worth anything. So I, I look at coins now and then, and I was looking at quarters. I said, something wrong with this quarter. And so I looked back, and I said, there's definitely something wrong with this quarter. So I put two quarters down there that are current and one that's past. And in one, George Washington is facing left. And the other one, George Washington is facing right. And on the back, there's no longer anything about states and all that kind of stuff. It's all about activists. We've, we've politicized our quarters. And so these are pioneer people, women, nothing wrong with pioneer women, why would you put them on our money when there's activism involved in every one of them? And one of them is a Chinese movie star. The first Chinese movie star. That's so important to me, I think I would throw that quarter into the deepest sea I can find. <laughs> what do I care about a Chinese actor, actress? Or an Indian activist? or some of the other activists, or a poet activist. Anyway, they're there, you can see them, you can have fun with it, and it shows you that through 2025, it just, it'll get worse. So, Exodus chapter 16, if you can change your mind about everything here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a, a few verses here, so uh, would you stand with me if you can? Don't worry if you can't. And we'll read the first six verses, another verse, and then a few more. And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses <clears throat> and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. And then a nice thing to do after you've been redeemed at Egypt. When we sat by the flesh pots and when we did eat bread to the full, for you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto the, all the children of Israel at even, then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. Okay, verse 8. And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening to eat and the morning bread to the full, for the Lord heareth your murmurings which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Verse 10, And it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I have heard the murmurings of the children of Israel. Speak unto them, saying, At even ye shall eat flesh, and in the morning ye shall be filled with bread, and ye shall know that I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass that at even the quails came up, covered the camp, and in the morning the dew lay round about. 
Okay, I'm gonna have a word of prayer. We'll, we'll pick up some, somewhere else here. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Uh, the history that is mentioned here is real and it's there for our learning. It's there for, for we who are saved to make application to and understand the truth of, of the meaning of what took place. And we, we look to you to speak to our hearts here today. Uh, we come to you with great needs and only you can meet those needs. And so we would ask that you speak specifically to each and every one of us here, each and every one that's watching, and that you would meet those needs in Christ. If anybody is lost, Father, we again pray for their salvation. This is not churchianity, this is not religion, this is Christianity. Christianity understands that Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost, that's everybody, and that he went to the cross for those sins that we have committed and or would commit and paid the price in his blood, with his blood, and paid the price in full, died and was buried and rose again the third day and offers a salvation that is complete, full, free, forever. And so we just ask you to do what I certainly cannot do and, and anybody else cannot do, and that is to bring the needed conviction. And so I ask you to see through the infirmities here <clears throat> and that you use the reading of your word, the message uh, to bring us close to the, if we're saved and saved if we're lost. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now you can be seated, Micah has done a uh, study before uh, incorporating some things about manna, which we're going to look at, and I think very effectively. And and as a result of, I think, what he had done, I, I looked back at, the, at chapter 16, 17, 15, and in these chapters, and came to the place where I wanted to bring forth the ministry of the manna, which we know from John 5 and John 6, uh, was a type of Christ and therefore is very important to us and as we should learn as much as we can uh, about it. So the background is very familiar. Uh, the Lord has, has slain the firstborn of, in the land of Egypt. All of the Jews killed the sacrificial lamb, put the blood on the doorpost and were redeemed out of Egypt. And the numbers according to Exodus 12, 37, 38, 600,000 men and children and wives and mixed multitude. A conservative estimate. You understand what that estimate is? Is two million. More likely two and a half million, but I like two million because you can do things more with an even number. So, I'd like you to consider this morning the task before Moses and Aaron. I don't know what the population of Florida is, but it's almost the whole state, isn't it? Half the state. I think there's four million in, in Florida. Not sure. And I want you to put yourself in that number. I mean, you're virtually an unknown. You, know, you could be just a number, but I mean, there's 12 tribes to mix a multitude. There's so many in each tribe. And they all cr cross the Red Sea on dry ground. A time-consuming, miraculous victory. Do you know how long it would take to cross? Let's say, let's say it's the width of the Indian River where they crossed, which it probably was, to take two, two million people and, and animals on dry ground to get to the other side. Three days later, in chapter 15, verses 22 and 24, they're all thirsty, but there's no water to drink. All the water's bitter. And what do they do? How long? Three days. And they start complaining. And they murmur. There's, there are some great lessons that are learned here, by the way, 
on the really the the blackness of our hearts when the lord can do such a great thing for you get you out of slavery and three days later there's an obstacle and you murmur and you go or groan and you complain and so god gives them a condition look over here in chapter 15 in verse 26 a condition to to victory further victory and he and said <clears throat> if thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the lord thy god and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes i will put none of these diseases upon thee which i have brought upon the egyptians for i am the lord that healeth thee and so he leads them to elam where there were 12 wells of water and of course um, that's a lot of water that needs to be consumed does anybody know what the average family consumes a day in water i don't know but they say they say on an average three gallons so let's say they're correct two million times three gallons that was some hefty well drinking let me tell you I mean, if you th the wells had to be, they had to be of the Lord because it's a wonder that they wouldn't run dry. They're in the desert. 45 days later, they're hungry. They're in chapter 16. And guess what? The black heart murmurs again. We needed water. You provided water. We didn't ask to be redeemed out of Egypt, but you redeemed us out of Egypt. No, likely, no, you didn't ask to be saved. The Lord saves you when you called on him. You may not have known the whole story, but if you called on him in faith to save you, he saves you. And so now they're thinking about, let's go back. It's amazing. To Egypt, a type of sin, a type of the world. Surely, in our enlightened age, after all these centuries, thousands of years, God's people wouldn't want to return to the world they were saved out of, would they? Oh yeah, let me tell you, many do. There's a lot of them just like Lot's wife. They get taken out, but their heart's still there and they look back. And maybe they don't turn to a pillar of salt, but their heart sure is hard as a rock. So God promises bread from heaven here in the form of what we call manna. The Bible calls manna in chapter 17 later on from the rock, capital R, another type of Christ, the giver of the Holy Ghost. So I want to look at this ministry of the manna. So go down to verse 14. The first thing I want to deal with is the appearance of the manna. Again, we're dealing with a type of Christ. 16, 14. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. So we see, first of all, the sending of the dew. It came down, just like Christ came down. Uh, the Israelites couldn't go up, and so the Lord, the Lord brought something down from heaven, just like he came down. Uh, we couldn't go up in the, in, in the flesh either. We couldn't gain access to Christ any other way. We couldn't, we couldn't go to heaven. We couldn't have a relationship with the Father uh, by anything that we did, anything work-related, um, no matter what religious teachers may say. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes and him it should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's very simple. And it's important that everybody understands that in a world where many people don't understand much spiritual. Then we see the situation of it. We see that it was early, probably right before sunlight, early to sunrise. You have a picture here of humility. If you're going to find the manna, 
You needed to look down. You had to have your eyes on the ground. Just like Christ lowered himself in Philippians chapter 2. Hold your place here. Philippians chapter 2. Again, I hope these are not new verses to you. But if they are, praise the Lord for maybe the, the effect that they should have on you. Philippians chapter 2. And let's look here in verse 5, Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says, we have the mind of Christ, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He came down. He, he gave the manna from heaven. It came down. Again, all symbolical with dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ. And in salvation, you have to see yourself as God does. I didn't, have the, I didn't have any problem with that. I knew I was lost. I knew I was incomplete. I knew I was undone. And I guess the honest opinion is I probably was full of myself. And full of pride. God hates pride. But if we're gonna, if we're gonna come to Christ as, in our salvation, you can't, you can't go as a, hey, I'm deserving of salvation. I'm a good guy. No, you're not. None of us are. We all need to be saved. Now, cults declare that the truth was lost until they came around and, and perverted the gospel for their own benefit. One of them says that they are the best people on the earth. The people, the people of this cult believes, firmly believes that they teach it, they preach it, it's in their books. We are the best people on the face of the earth. Another one says that if you're not one of them, you're of the devil. As a matter of fact, if you're here worshiping God on Sunday, they believe you take the mark of the beast. If you worship on Sunday, that's how far it goes. Pride, it's disgusting in God's eyes. Salvation isn't deserved. We were, we were enemies before being saved. And in the Christian life, we need that same humility in our, in our walk. We need humility in, in the way we walk in Christ, our demeanor, our worship, our prayer life. All of that has to be in, in a humble manner. It, it, where do we get off and to think, you know, we can just recite things and nothing matters. It all matters. All right, number three, also in verse 14, we see the shape of it. This small round thing, so it was circular. That also signifies the Lord Jesus Christ and serves as a reminder that salvation has, is, is dealing with eternal life. There is no end. There was a beginning, but there is no end. How do you, how do you read everlasting life and put a limit on it? It's an ending. It, it's forever. And and it serves, as, whereas for Israel, of course, it had to do with their physical life. All right, John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Verse 47. One of the great gospel verses in the book of John. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath, present tense, everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that man may eat thereof and not die. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not dead. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man 
Did he eat? Are we in chapter 6 or 5? Or it should be in 6. You couldn't find any sources in 5. Uh, so it, it, the Jew in verse uh, 51 Man eat of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? And you go on, and it shows that this is also spiritual, and it's easy to figure out. So there's much that is done with regard to the natural life. Many times we'll read through these and think, okay, this all refers to the people of Israel, doesn't refer to us. Well, you've got to make the spiritual applications or you're just going to be dead in the water. Manna came to teach dependence on the Lord God. There was no way they were going to get it. After the, the quail, there was no way they were getting food aside from God. And so he gives these instructions and so forth, and they were to be dependent on, on, on him to do that. And of course, there's, there goes beyond to the coming Messiah. And, and when we speak of him, it has to do with sustained life. And of course, to us, eternal life in Christ alone. The world never saw anything like that back here when this happened in the wilderness. They never saw anything like Christ either. We were reading in Sunday school the conversations between the, the scribes, the Pharisees, and so forth, and the questions going back and forth. No one, no one ever spoke like he did, and with the authority he had. So, 1 Corinthians 2.14 comes to play here. The, the Bible is a spiritually discerned book. In the flesh, you cannot understand it. In the flesh, you're going to question much that is discussed spiritually. But you need the Holy Spirit here uh, and the eye of faith because really that's in direct contradiction to, to everything today that is so highly accepted and revered. I mean, we have the natural versus the sp spiritual. The world teaches anti-creation. In all likelihood, if you were in a government school as a child, you learned anti-creation. You also were taught anti-morality and anti-Christ, anti-Bible. And you've been taught that for so long, guess what? It breaks you down. And after a while, there's many people that actually believe that. They actually believe that rot, that kind of stuff. When in fact, you take this book with a spiritual eye, you have no problem seeing God in creation. Before I was saved, I didn't, I mean, I was taught evolution. There was a discussion of creation but I could see something just didn't come into being. There had to be a, a maker. And in all of nature, there had to be, there had to be some, I didn't know who that was. I thought, well, God, whoever that was. But I knew there, there had to be. And with that little tiny piece of light, God gave me more light. And then more light. And then one day I got saved. And then the light turned on brightly, then I know the difference between the two. So this is important. All right, and then verse 16, there's the showing of it. The showing of the manna. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Gather it, every man according to his eating, an omer for every man according to the number of your persons, take ye every man for them which are in his tents. I'm going to notice a couple of things here. Three times in the verse, it speaks to every man. There were not people, let's say, of the tribe of Judah that were exempt or any of the other tribes. Every man of the tribe of Judah, probably the household leader, 
was required to go out and look for the manna every morning. And you see, of course, its size, it, it, and it, it, the amount you looked for was according to the size, whether small or great, of your household. So every man, I look at this as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation. Um, spiritual to us and, and of course in the Christian life. We believe in a whosoever of salvation. Not, not one of these uh, limited to a, a select few that don't need to regard their spiritual condition at all or their inability to save themselves and thereby pass over totally calling upon him in faith as their savior. Or reading some of their books or pictures. And it, 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 people like this, I, I, I question whether they're saved at all. How can, you, how can you be saved if you've never called on the Lord Jesus Christ to save you? And like, the, like the, the girl told me, why do I need to do that? I said, because the Bible tells you that's what you need to do. No, I've been selected. That's from the pit of hell. It sounds good to her, but it's not good. So every morning, the breaking of, dawn, of a new day, what, whoever, what's going on in, in their lives, they had to go out and feed, pick up, actually get, receive the manna, and use it in their lives. And guess what? Every day, in your day, in my day, you can go get up and you can read God's word, which is the manna, and if you'll take it and receive it, you'll be able to, because it's a type of Christ, you'll be able to have victory. It's important. So after this appearance, we see the sequence of the manna. So I'm skipping a lot of verses, but it's good for you to go back and read them. Verse 23, 23 through 25. And he said unto them, this is, th this is that which the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the, rest, is the rest of the Holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today, and seethe that you will seethe, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. And they laid it up till the morning as Moses bade, and they did not stink, neither was there any worm therein. And Moses said, Eat that today, for today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today he shall not find it in the field. Okay, you're getting some clear direction here. Verse 26, Six days shall you gather it, but on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath, in it there shall be none. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found none. All right, so the gathering was from the first day of the week to the sixth day of the week, because the seventh day of the week was the Sabbath. And each day you picked up a, da a daily provision. On the last day before the seventh, you picked up a double provision. And obviously, the, the, one had to, the, the one had to hold true for the next day. Okay, that was and is God's plan. That, that was his direction. All right, now verse, go down to verse 29. See, that for, see, for the Lord hath given you the Sabbath, therefore giveth you on the sixth day the bread of two days. Abide ye every man in his place, that no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Okay, so that ties in with the sequence here and the directions. We are to feed off of what we have been given in God's word. And when we do, there will be a peace that passes all understanding. Say, so you, well, there talks about, you know, in Philippians 4, that we are to, let's go to Philippians 4, we are to pray and to give thanks and so forth. And then, well, I think it's pretty clear. If you're going to feed on God's word, 
This plays a very important part. Verse 6, Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing. Or be careful for nothing. Uh, don't be nervous about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. All right, when you're taking in God's word, and you're making that personal, and you're, you're doing something with it internally, and maybe making the application externally, guess what? You're doing the right thing. You're not supposed to ask, well, wait a minute, I've been doing the right thing, why did this happen? No, you can have bad things happen, but you can still have the peace of God because you know you're doing the right thing. You know you're doing the right thing. I think it's, it's a bit shameful. Today we see professing Christians being the most soul restless people under the circumstances, instead of that, which, that inner peace that comes through the application of God's people. This is a soul rest. This, this is not supposed to be a, a day when nobody does anything whatsoever. It's a day when you, your soul rests. You take it easy. You feed on the word more, maybe more on, the, on this, this day. I'm, I'm making assumptions. But if there's anybody here that doesn't read your Bible every day, then this is all you're getting. And that in and of itself is shameful. And so maybe you're getting some benefit from it, but nothing like you're supposed to. And in times of danger and in times of trial and, and problems, you're not going to be prepared to deal with those because you're, you're equipped to get under the circumstances instead of go through them. And that's important. This, th these were given with a spiritual emphasis that many of them did not understand, but we do because we're in the New Testament. We see what Christ is doing. All right, so here, here's the effect of the manna. Verse 31. And the house of Israel called the name there of manna. And it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Uh, like coriander seed. It's not coriander seed, it's like it. White. In Numbers 11, they referred to it as a pearl. The color of a pearl. It could, be, it could be white or it could be a shiny silver. Its taste was good and it was good for food. It wasn't filled with additives. It didn't have manna mixed with whatever concoction you make up. No, it was pure manna. Pure manna, just like God's word. We don't we don't mix God's word with man's word and, and expect to come to the same conclusion. I meant to ask, I didn't, uh, during Sunday school, and I forgot, I even forgot the subject, about the verses in, that we read being changed in some of these other versions so that you don't get the definition of, of what was going on. And I forgot what it was. So anyway, they called it manna. Manna means it's a question, what is this? It's basically what they didn't know. Psalm 34, Psalm 34. They understand that this is, we're dealing with the entire nation of Israel plus this mixed multitude, however many that is. And every day in the morning, there's enough food to feed two million people plus. Every day. I've seen pictures of, of uh, really good draw, drawings, even from Friends of Israel years ago of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And they showed, they showed the tribes scattered about, and they were all real close. You couldn't get two million people even remotely close to the tabernacle. It would be so big, it would be so great. So this is a massive undertaking. 
Psalm 34, verse 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Once, you, once you've tasted of Christ, I mean really tasted of Christ and in his salvation, you want more. His food is good. It tastes good. It's unmixed. It's pure. 50 years, 60 years, 70 years later, after your first state, taste, you're still seeking more. And he's, and he's equipped to give you more. And feeds you to satisfaction every day. I mean, we emphasize this and emphasize this and emphasize this. But I guarantee you, you th if you think, well, this is for a select few people, then you're not understanding the manna was for everyone. It was for everyone. And there's no difference in, in what I'm saying between you and me or anybody else that's saved. So the effects of the manna take pretty much the rest of the chapter. And in verse 32, we see this testimony. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded, command us. Fill an omer of it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread wherewith I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you forth from the land of Egypt. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer full of manna therein and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. So they were to keep, keep one for their family. And of course, over time it would spoil. And then the other one was put into the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And it would, would sustain itself. So it testified to Israel's future generations as their necessary food. Because for 40 years, this is how they were fed. God's food. How long have you been saved? You know. How many of those years have you, fe have you feasted on God's word? How many of those weeks, how many of those days have you feasted on God's word? He expects you to feast on it every day. Sometimes you get more, sometimes you get less. Christ is the living bread. This is who we are. <clears throat> I am not who I am apart from that. You are not who you are in Christ apart from that. That's it. In 35, and the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to a land inhabited. They did eat manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. Now an omer is a tenth part of Ephah. 40 years every morning, enough for each household, and on the sixth day, a double portion. It kept them alive. It was all sufficient for them, physically. What does God's word do for you? Does it keep you going? You should answer yes, if, if you're reading it and applying it, take it in and apply it. Think of it, two million people fed each day from God, whether a large family or a small family. Think of it, how many people are represented here or watching, I don't know the number. Those that are saved every day, feeding on God's, God's word, all sufficient. Unless you do like some of them, and didn't do what you were told to do. So let me ask you, is God sufficient for your life? Is he all sufficient for your life, Christian life? I hope you would answer yes. Is he all sufficient for your walk as a Christian? I hope you would answer yes. Is he all sufficient in, in the business of spiritual warfare? I hope you would answer yes. Is he all sufficient so that you would be a good soldier of Jesus Christ 
And I hope you would answer yes to that as well. He can guide each of us, each and every one of us, and take care of us. If you, if you have a Bible with you, mark it down. This is your choice. And if you have no use from bread from heaven, don't whine, don't murmur, because you will, like the Israelites do, will, and complain what one comes your way because you were not nourished enough or mature enough to handle the trials and hard times. I'm not trying to over, uh, underplay things that go on in our lives, but I'm saying this word is sufficient to take you through every one of those successfully. Look back at verse 20. Notwithstanding, they hearkened not unto Moses. Some of them left it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with them. What bred worms and stank? Not taking the manna and consuming it. That can be your life, you know, because you're not taking the word. You're not consuming it. Apply that to your Bible life. Apply that to your prayer life. Apply that to your, your church life. As I, I, am, I am so thankful years ago when it was brought up, you know, maybe we can do something live. I said, well, you know, I didn't know anything about that. Still don't know anything about it. I know it works. I know how it works, not the operation of it. And, and I'm thankful because that's a wonderful aspect of this ministry. There are people over the years that are, that are homebound. There are people that are out long distance away from us. And I'm, and I'm thankful for that. But it also is, in, is inducive to being pure, 100% lazy. Why do I need to be there? Uh, because we're supposed to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. What, because, and it encourages other people as well, and probably you as well. Verse 21, if you didn't get it early, verse 21, they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating. When the sun waxed hot, it melted. You get it before it's gone. It applies to every age. You get what God is giving you as a young person, middle, later, old. You get it. You've got to get it. You have to get it. You can't be force-fed it and think that you're getting it. You have to get it. So, we who have control over young people, or you that have control over young people, do you persuade them to be faithful or unfaithful? Because we all have that effect. Deuteronomy 6, if you read that carefully, you can see Deuteronomy 6, the effect of the parent or the people in authority to those that are younger. You're, t you're taking them one place or the other. And yourself, where are you taking yourself? Well, maybe later, maybe when I, I know more than I know now, then you probably won't. It doesn't happen. Taste the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll want more and more and more, even longer than the 40 years in the wilderness. It said when they got there, it stopped. And now they had to use the resources that were before them. This bread of heaven, this living, the bread, the Lord Jesus Christ is available to you. He did all of the work to make this available. He came down, took on flesh, lived a sinless life after being born of a virgin. Went to the cross, paid your debt. Your debt may have been massive, it may have been small, it doesn't matter, we all had a debt we could not pay, and he paid it in full. 
And he offers to you salvation in him and in him alone. But you've got to receive him and do something with that afterwards, not to be saved, but because you are. So when they have it, Israel baked it and they boiled it or they boiled it. I'm not real good with boiled food. Baked's probably better. So they had the choice. They just, but, they, but the point is they labored in it. And so must we if we're going to get anywhere in the Christian life. If we're going to get anywhere in worship, if we're going to get anywhere in, in our Bible, in our study, in our reading, uh, anywhere in our, in our prayer life, anywhere in our fellowship, it has to be taking what God gives us, the pure word, getting it when we're young, getting it when we're up early, not allowing what he's giving us to just lay on the floor and rot. Because you will develop a hard heart and you'll not even know you've got a hard heart until things come your way that are counterproductive to what you think should be taking place. Uh, I'm not saying you don't question things that happen because we don't always know everything. Uh, there were things that have happened uh, in, in our, our lives as, as a family. And so where did this come from? How, how, how did this happen? And then you have to move through that. And you have to deal with that. And, and you do that to the best of your ability through Christ. But you, where, where do we feed to here, from here? We feed from here and, and use this. This is so important. And everything has been emphasized, even in Sunday school and last week, uh, you know, all right, there's a fresh start. Every day you get up is a fresh start. Every day in Lamentations 3, you get and you look at the sun, the sunrises are all different. Not two of them the same. But his faithfulness extends to all generations. And you need to see that and act on that. So whatever, whatever is taking place in, in the reading of history and applying it, I hope you'll see much more than what you've seen before, that they, they depended on this. And there were an awful lot of people that depended on the Lord's faithfulness to give them that manna every day. And he successfully gave it to them. And maybe they didn't like it. Maybe they did. But it said it tasted good. And it, and it had honey in it. And it was pure. Nothing better than that which is pure. Let's pray. As you bow your heads here this morning, I, as, as you, don't know the spiritual condition of anybody else here, but I know that the Lord does. And he offers salvation, not on your terms, but on his. And if you're ready to accept what he has for you, then you come, if you haven't before, let somebody show you how you can know without any question about being saved. In a Christian life, it's the same basis. He knows what you need. He's given the, the instructions to victory. And he just asks you to obey. Trust and obey. There's no other way to really be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. And the reason we don't is because we don't pick up the book. We either disbelieve the book, or we don't think it's for us. Everything in there is for us. And we will give an answer for it one day. So whatever is taking place, I praise the Lord for each and every person here who feeds daily, not mechanically, but daily, and is nourished by what is read, and is able to give it out and live it out. 
and it provides victory. Sometimes it's not, very, not seen for days or months, but it provides victory. And down the road, God is going to answer everything that he said he wanted to do in the way he wanted it done. And we need to be on the, on the victorious side of all that. Father, have your way here in the invitation. We know, we know who we are. We know what we're doing or we're not doing. We know what you expect. But I think he doesn't want your excuse or your reasoning. He just wants your obedience. Solomon said to his son, my son, give me thine heart. We can do that. And I pray if the Lord's speaking to your heart here, maybe in some other way, if there's maybe somebody here that's been saved, never followed the Lord in believer's baptism. Not a saving issue, an identification issue. And his death, burial, and resurrection. Some of you may be here and, and you're speaking to them about the intent of joining in with this local church. This would be a good time to make that known. But whatever's going on, Father, I just pray that we would respond in kind. And we ask this in Jesus' name.